aptly named Ozcott. At Ozcott, uh, he started, uh, he had a big backyard, started his own garden, became very good at growing chrysanthemums and dahlias. As he had done wherever his travels had taken him, Baum threw himself into local society, joining clubs and making friends throughout the community. Baum never really abandoned the theater, and indeed, his best theater writing, and I think the most fun he ever had in the theater, were toward the end of his life when he started writing musicals for himself and his friends for a society called the Uplifters. It was probably one of the happiest times in Baum's life when he was acting and writing and playing around. I think it brought the joy back to it because he wasn't trying to get rich off of it. In choosing Hollywood for a home, Baum was a pioneer. Not more than six months after his arrival, the very first movie studio was established there. And within a few years, Hollywood would become the center of the motion picture industry. Even before coming to Hollywood, Baum had recognized the power of motion pictures to tell a story. And in 1914, with a group of prominent friends from the Los Angeles Athletic Club, he formed the Oz Film Manufacturing Company. Baum immediately threw himself into producing a series of Oz stories, but once again, he was ahead of his time. Kids were not being brought to the theaters by their parents. The parents wanted to get away from the children or didn't think this was an appropriate medium for the children. Just a whole bunch of things which basically spelled disaster. And the company failed within a year of its uh, opening. But still, L. Frank Baum had, had, this, had the vision that would eventually become the 1939 Wizard of Oz. He knew that the Wizard of Oz would become a successful motion picture. So here's a case where it didn't really fail. He was just so far ahead of his time. It just couldn't work. L. Frank's health towards the last couple of years, probably beginning about 1915, 1916, began to go downhill. I believe by the time he was about 60, 59, 60, I think he realized that something was going on. None of us want to face it, but I think he realized that that time would come. As he aged, and I guess uh, the cigars and so forth caught up with him. It was harder for him to write, but he still kept up a, as hectic a pace as he possibly could. And there was one particular period of time, uh, Nawad noticed he wasn't typing much in the morning, if anything. And he'd go down and he'd sit and he'd move around and he'd work in the garden and he'd sit down and he'd come in for lunch. And, well, Frank, how's the writing going? It's not working. I, it's just this, a story I just can't get it to work out. And this went on for two or three weeks. And finally, one day for lunch, he came in and sat down, and she noticed that he had a lot of uh, writing on his pad. Well, Frank, did you uh, work out all the difficulties? I said, well, Maud, no. I just let the characters do what they wanted to. And I think that is probably a window into his mind. I think the ideas and the characters are there, and when they're ready, they will say, okay, Frank, grab your pencil and write this down, because here it goes. Because his health was somewhat frail, he actually worked ahead and completed a couple of extra Oz books that would carry the series on if he should die. By the spring of 1919, Baum knew he was dying. His already weakened heart was giving out on him, and there were times when he was barely able to lift his head from his pillow. Yet even as his body failed, Baum's vivid imagination remained as fertile as ever. Early on the morning of May 6, 1919, L. Frank Baum awakened for the last time. Turning to his wife, he uttered the words, now we can cross the shifting sands, and within a moment, he was gone. When he died, I remember the New York Times uh, a few days later reported it on their editorial page and just said, in effect, L. Frank Baum is dead, and the children, if they knew it, would mourn. But no one felt the loss as much as his beloved and devoted Maud. When you read the letter that Maud wrote the day after his death, I don't think she ever let people know how really hard it was on her, because basically they were each other's life. 
he devoted his entire life to her. If she needed something, he didn't do something else. He was there. He told her on his deathbed that she was the first and the only person he ever loved, and she told him the same.